Hello, welcome to ISD Talks. My name is Anastasia Lavrina. In this edition, we are going to talk about the bilateral relations between the United States of America and China, perspectives and challenges. And my guest now is Zhang Si, Associate Professor at East China Normal University. Hello and welcome to our program. And my pleasure to have before we start to talk about bilateral relations between China and the United States, I would like to ask a question about military development of China. What attention is being paid to this area now due to the global processes? Uh, the overall trend is uh, quite clear. Uh, military modernization has been on the uh, top agenda, part of the top agenda of the Chinese state uh, to develop a more efficient, more mobile, uh, modern military that doesn't rely on pure manpower has been the um, general direction for several decades. Uh, and also the state has um, uh, invested uh, increasing amount of resources in military modernization. Um, also, um, the, uh, the military development still is a land-based uh, self-defense mode. Uh, that's, that's been the traditional mode for a long time. But I think the interest uh, in developing uh, both the Navy and the Air Forces with uh, certain uh, long-range uh, uh, capacity of projection is also becoming more and more uh, relevant and more and more important uh, for the military modernization. I think these are the general uh, trend. Uh, I think the uh, geopolitical confrontation in the region, uh, unfortunately, is on the rise. I think the military modernization is definitely also uh, helping the state to prepare a possible uh, further uh, geopolitical uh, confrontation in the region and maybe even beyond. During his recent visit to Washington, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Qi made it clear that China is ready to restore communication channels between the two countries' defense ministers. How far can the resumption of U.S.-China military and political contacts go? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we are going to see the so the first chapter of a series of uh, uh, interaction between United States and China for the possibly next two or three decades. Uh, it's a long uh, period of uh, finger pointing mutual accusation uh, alongside with a short period of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, normalization of a, a relationship. That kind of dynamics will be probably uh, developing for the for the uh, the next next uh, few years or even into the next one or two two decades. So this time we will see a periodical uh, normalization of some of the communication channels uh, as part of a normalization of bilateral relations, uh, starting from the military. But uh, I've seen also very clear sign in the uh, in the business sector uh, in terms of uh, resumption of aviation and also resumption of uh, uh, bilateral communication in the think tank scene, uh, in the higher education and the technology sector. So uh, it's not just just on the military uh, side. So uh, the general trend is uh, to resume some of the uh, normal uh, channels of communication as a first step uh, to uh, sort of reduce this um, uh, geopolitical uh, confrontation between the uh, two countries. But I, I, I've already pointed out uh, I see this as a short-term, um, uh, periodical short-term resumption of uh, uh, normalization of different aspects of the bilateral relations. But in the in the the, the long run uh, trend, uh, whether the long run trend of uh, competition rivalry can be fully checked uh, by these uh, short-term periodical sort of normalization, uh, I think is a big question. Uh, and uh, I'm not that uh, uh, optimistic on that. And the key question here is how China is able to manage the, the, the balance in the relations between the United States and Russia. I think the current uh, um, mood uh, in China is, is uh, the uh, U.S.-China relation is still regarded as the most important, most salient bilateral relation on the global uh, stage. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the Chinese state try to position a somewhat um, um, uh, we call it indigenous or autonomous relation with Russia in the sense that bilateral relation with Russia 
has its own logic, has its own uh, dynamics. It's not completely conditioned or dictated by China's relation with the United States. Right? So that has been the official uh, stance. Uh, in some sphere, obviously, the Chinese states, Russian states, share certain basic um, basic vision or basic views about, uh, for example, world order, about uh, regional re regional order, about the um, how to manage uh, international or regional affairs, right? Um, but also beyond that, the, the, the two sides has its own uh, well, sort of normal uh, commercial, cultural relation to develop. And so the idea is the bilateral relation between China and Russia has its own logic and develop along its own uh, dynamics, which is not completely dictated by China's relation with the United States. Uh, and overall, I think the uh, Chinese states um, still regards as its relation with Russia as um, uh, mostly as assets, assets by itself, not a liability, uh, assets by itself, and try to develop this autonomous relation with, uh, with Russia on its own, other than as a condition, as a derived result from China's rela relation with the United States. That's how I see it. But to make it clear, do you think that uh, China won't ally United States against Russia and uh, won't ally Russia against the United States, right? Uh, I think this is the, the right, uh, I think, general assessment right now. Try to stay away from this kind of balancing within this big, big three. And whether these big three are actually the most important, the most salient for the trilateral relation in the world is, is questioned, is being questioned. And I don't think this, this kind of vision, like the trilateral framework, uh, is the most important trilateral relation, dictates everything of China in China's foreign policy. That kind of framework is being questioned. And I, I seriously uh, suspect that that actually is what, uh, how Beijing sees the trilateral relation. I doubt, actually. I doubt that yeah, that's how Beijing sees it. Sees it. And uh, next question, what's China's role in strengthening the regional security? The region, if you mean the region, uh, uh, China's nearby, the neighborhood, of course, this is the, uh, this is the a priority of China's overall uh, foreign policy as dictated by some uh, uh, important foreign policy guideline uh, by the Chinese state. Right? Uh, the, 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 the neighborhood or the country or the region nearby is the prior, priority. Uh, I think the uh, Chinese state definitely uh, take that extremely seriously and has put increasing uh, resources, uh, increasing resources in maintaining particularly stability and the security of this uh, region. Uh, and I think it's uh, tried to um, achieve these goals through uh, several mechanisms. Uh, one is uh, several multi multilateral uh, platforms uh, um, uh, in different formats, for example, the six party talk, uh, and um, uh, increasingly important is the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization and also uh, bilateral mechanism with countries in, the, uh, for example, Southeast Asia, uh, Asian countries. So it tries to establish these either multilateral or uh, bilateral mechanisms uh, in the uh, nearby region or in the neighborhood to try to maintain um, uh, stability and security. Uh, and some of them are more successful. I would say SEO so far is more successful in uh, maintaining region, regional uh, security. Uh, but a six-party talk obviously is now in, uh, in, in stalemate, uh, at least. Right? So um, uh, we will see how uh, the Chinese state uh, learns, practice, and try to modify, uh, adapts the different uh, multilateral bilateral arrangement uh, to further maintain the stability of the nearby region. And also I need to emphasize um, the interest and the priority regarding regional stability uh, is more than just the military or terrorism. Uh, uh, increasingly, uh, uh, of uh, what we call non-traditional, uh, non-traditional uh, uh, risks, non-traditional um, security issues are also being uh, put on the higher agenda, uh, like natural disaster, uh, cross-border migration, uh, drug, uh, drug deals, etc. So those are, are are becoming more important in. China's overall assessment of uh, uh, security uh, uh, situation in the neighborhood and it will be also increasingly incorporated in
is a multilateral bilateral arrangement of uh, uh, regional security arrangement. I want to ask you about the details. So we know about the important role China plays um, in African region. The bilateral relations with many African countries is developing quite successfully. At the same time, China is a strong partner for Central Asian countries, and China also has its growing interest in the South Caucasus. So uh, what are the key priorities in the Chinese foreign policy you can highlight? I think it's it maybe better to put in a slightly different way, not, not just to see one or two regions as the most important, but these different regions or special units or geographic units plays a um, equally relevant but a different role. Uh, the big, uh, relation with the big power, particularly within the United States, is still the key. And uh, as I just mentioned, um, the, uh, the neighborhood, the country's area right uh, in the neighborhood of China is, uh, is the priority. And also the large, uh, broadly defined the developing world uh, has also been the uh, what we call the foundation of China's foreign uh, policy agenda. And then uh, all kinds of uh, uh, bilateral or particularly multilateral uh, platform provides the institutional uh, foundation or institutional platform for China's foreign policy uh, making. So I think uh, it might be helpful to see uh, these different geographic uh, units uh, play a slightly different role in uh, Beijing's overall position of China's role in the in the world and the China's relation with the different different worlds. Uh, for example, Africa become uh, really um, important or salient uh, somewhat in the late nineteen uh, early, late nineteen nineties, early two thousand. Right, uh, but uh, relation with the United States with uh, Russia uh, has been uh, part of uh, the top agenda for for a long time. Uh, so see this, these, uh, these different regions play a slightly different role and uh, along with a slightly different uh, temporal uh, dynamics in China's foreign, foreign policy making. Could you please also tell us about One Belt and One Road initiative, Chinese initiative, which, is, which has very important uh, meaning for many countries in the region and far beyond? Yes, uh, in the original uh, ima sort of imagined geography of Belt and Road, uh, especially the Rand route, uh, Central Asia, Caucasus, uh, all the way to Europe, uh, is a very key part of it. It's supposed to be the major uh, transit routes from Asia all the way to, to Europe. Um, I think that the countries in this region overall also have been uh, very positive in embracing uh, this uh, grandiose initiative. But with the past 10 years, we just celebrated the first 10-year uh, anniversary of this uh, initiative. Uh, it's also a good time for all parties involved to uh, look at uh, what has been achieved, what uh, has uh, fallen short of um, the original expectation in the Belt and Road Initiative, right? uh, including uh, the areas you just mentioned, Central Asia, Caucasus, etc. Uh, I think there will be uh, uh, physical infrastructure is still an important one, part of the implementation of the initiative, but we do see um, uh, a modification and adaptation of the initiative uh, particularly from uh, China's side, uh, for example, more uh, emphasis uh, and the possible funding will be directed to not uh, physical infrastructure, but those softer, supposedly softer uh, type of infrastructure uh, and also more uh, attention and resources will be devoted to um, somewhat uh, what we might call new topics and new issues, um, for example, uh, green economy, uh, green economy, green uh, energy, green uh, agriculture, uh, and also um, uh, finance, uh, different aspects of the financial sector. So those are uh, some of the recent development I see, and they are obviously also re re relevant for uh, countries in Central Asia, in the Caucasus, uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Well, and uh, what's your opinion about Global Gateway Initiative just recently, the European Commission held a Global Gateway Investment Forum in Brussels. As they say, this is an alternative to the Chinese One Belt, One Road. So how did Beijing perceive this behavior of Europe? Yeah, uh, I think overall mood uh, within China is, um, is, uh, uh, is somewhat is a, the puzzlement. Why, why does EU or European uh, Europe as a whole 
uh, try to portray this uh, global gateway as a, a competitive project against or with uh, China's uh, similar um, uh, Silk Road projects. It doesn't have to be. Uh, uh, if we just look at the pure economic and the technical side of the uh, France, Europe, Eurasia, or um, Europe Asia continent connectivity, it's very clear there is a huge gap of lack of uh, attention, lack of uh, funding in even in the physical infrastructure part. Now, let's say on those softer softer side, but in just the pure traditional uh, physical infrastructure, that we are very clear we're in uh, a big uh, shortage. And then uh, even uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative itself, even if it's very successful implement, wouldn't be able to uh, fill in the gap. So why not um, uh, Europe, uh, China, Asia, Europe, uh, both put resources and efforts uh, to uh, encourage and promote uh, transcontinental uh, connectivity. Uh, whether it's called the Silk Road or called the Global Gateway actually matter very little. Right? So I think the, the, the mood there uh, uh, in the circles I observe is why not we do things together uh, since we are all in, uh, in very much uh, similar, similar goals. I try to, uh, try to connect uh, uh, Europe, Asia in a more efficient uh, well, more efficient way. I think that's the dominant move I see. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining our program today. Okay, my pleasure.